So that leaves the other choice, which is root x. Okay. So um, I have um, inconveniently used this letter already. So what letter would you like me to choose? Being that I can choose any letter I like. Theta? Theta? Psh, why not? Okay. Um, I mean, it's not an angle, but it's a letter. Let me use it for whatever I like. Don't choose that. Okay. So I'm going to just call it theta. Okay. If theta is root x, which is x to the power of a half, what is d theta on dx? One on two root x, yeah? One on two root x. Okay, so far so good. What else am I going to need to do here? I'm going to have to change the boundaries. I'm going to have to work with, uh, work with all of these guys here, right? So what will happen when you think about this, just pause for a minute. I'm actually going to do something a little bit sneaky. Don't write this down just yet. If I think about it as an indefinite integral, this would just be needed for me. The reason why I'm stopping this is because I know the boundaries for me are going to just complicate things. So if I think about it as an indefinite integral and I work out what the primitive is, I can take advantage of that for the definite integral. Okay? So I'm going to temporarily forget that it's a definite integral. If I just use this, okay, what's that going to turn if I was um, asking you this? Just this with no boundaries. Uh, dx. Okay, you've got all these pieces, yeah? So what am I going to do here? Theta squared plus one over what? X is equal to root x squared. Okay, so I'm going to have to square something because, interestingly, I would usually say, oh, okay, I'm going to replace uh, that with a theta, okay? But in fact, being that I've just seen this, I'm not going to replace that theta. I'm going to replace it with d theta on dx. That's a much better use of it, right? I'm going to do two things in one go. I'm going to change that root x that's there. It's actually on the denominator. And I'm going to change the variable in the ratio. Cool. But that leaves this guy, which is unchanged, right? So what is x plus 1? Yeah, yeah. To get, to get an, um, an x plus 1 out of this, I have to square both sides, which will give me theta squared. And then I just have to add 1. Do you see that? So if I'm now considering this, watch, watch this, all in one go. Let's put this in the right spot. So that, let's put him over there, because I actually have a 1 on root x in my integrand. Do you see that? Okay. What's going to happen? Two. This is 1 over theta squared plus 1. There's the 1 over x plus 1. Times, I've got 1 on root x in there. So this is my 2 d theta on dx. Do you see that? You see what I've done? Cancel, cancel. This is super easy, right? There's that 2 out the front. 1 on theta squared plus 1 d theta. Are you okay with that? Which is just 10 inverse, isn't it? Okay. So I'm going to take that, and now I'm going to bring it over here. Okay. Just be careful. What are we going to get? What's going to happen? Oh, you did say. We need, um, we need some boundaries, right? Do we need some boundaries? Are we going to need to worry about boundaries here? Can't you just evaluate that and then this? Put in the okay, so yeah, watch, right? Can you integrate this for me? We stopped short of doing it. Oh, sorry, two chances. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're going to evaluate it. Ah, but here, here's, a, here's a beautiful thing, right? Usually we would say, oh, okay, I better change my boundaries because I'm going to evaluate theta boundaries, not x boundaries, okay? But here, remember I said to you, uh, kind of icky, I don't want to deal with these limits and infinities and zeros and that kind of thing. So all I have to do to avoid that problem is turn this back into whatever the original boundaries were in. Right? Do you see that? So now that I'm going to put values into x, I don't have to worry about theta boundaries. I'm back in my original language, right? Is that okay? So now that I'm ready, I have fully integrated these things, okay? I can evaluate all of these in one hit, okay? Having got that up my sleeve, right? So, oops, I rubbed out a bit. So let's have a look at the first one. I've got the limit as u approaches zero of what? Two? Two ten, two, ten inverse of root x. That's what I said was going to be the premium function, right? Don't need to worry about the constant because I'm about to evaluate it at u and one. Plus, okay, now I've got the limit as u approaches infinity of this other guy. But it's the same, it's the same primitive function, just different boundaries, yeah?
How are you doing so far? Do you see what we've done? So I've taken advantage of this. I know how to actually integrate this thing once I do the appropriate substitution. I've done something a bit unusual, which is that usually I change all my boundaries and variables and function, but here I've come back to x, so I don't have to change my boundaries. Okay? Let's evaluate this thing. What's this thing going to be equal to? Well, you do the upper boundary first. That's easy. Okay? So that's going to be 2 tan inverse of root what? 1. 1. Okay? Take away. And then you do the lower boundary, but the lower boundary invokes a limit. So you just write down the limit. Now just pause for a second before we write the rest of this. Have a look. I've deliberately tried to leave this on the board here, right? Even though the integrator was not defined at the chosen boundaries, right? The primitive is, look at this guy. As you approach a zero, that's completely well defined. What's it doing? What is 10 inverse doing as you get closer and closer to zero from both ends? It's getting to zero. So I can deal with that just fine. Now I haven't left myself enough space, so I'm going to go on to the next line. But let's do this other boundary now, right? Um, again, this part has an upper boundary which has a limit in it, so I'm going to go limit as you approach infinity this time of 2 tan inverse root u. Same thing I had before. What happens on the end? Subtract. Bam. Okay. Uh, this is really nice. I didn't even know. I mean, you know what tan inverse of um, 1 is. Tan inverse of 1, of course, is. Uh, four, but it doesn't matter, it goes away anyway, yep. And so then what I get left with is these two guys. So you told me that this one just evaluates out to zero. Yeah. What happens to this guy? What's happening as, here's, here's the um, tan inverse graph. What happens to tan inverse as you approach infinity? What's it getting to? It's going somewhere. It's going to pi on 2. That's what the equation of this asymptote is, right? Now, it doesn't actually ever get there, but because I have a limit pair, it kind of does, right? So I say, well, this is um, 2 times pi on 2. There's that 2 that came from there. You see that? So this, in fact, is just equal to pi. And now you can see one of the reasons why. There are two big reasons why this is such a famous result. Okay? Number one, it's, it's like all kinds of unbounded. It's like it's unbounded that way, vertical asymptote. Unbounded this way, it goes to infinity. And once you deal with it, you end up with this nice convenient result, which coincidentally, this I believe also comes out to. Or is it a coincidence? So you can see I can take advantage of um, these, these properties here. Right? If you can divide things up, they often become easier to do. And if your function is not defined, if your integrand is not defined, then see if you can actually take the limits and you might get something that is well defined at the other end, as you frequently do. Okay?